Today, we're going to get an up and close personal look at the different mechanisms of a world record holding FTC robot. The Red Alliance has officially surpassed the world record. I'm Coach Pratt, and I've been teaching robotics and design for over a decade now, and I've led FTC teams to winning national championships. And today, we're taking a look at 15083 Overclock. They're fresh off some world record holding matches with one of their teammates, and we're going to take a look at how their robot functions. And it's impressive. Almost 70% 3D printed design. Tell me about your general approach to this decode season. What is your strategy? Okay, so to start off the game, we first off wanted to build simple. So being very consistent, hitting those ranking points. And doing, and we did that sort of within our means. So this year and even last year as well, our robot is over 70% 3D printed. So having that rapid prototyping was critical to our game strategy and how we sort of build our robot from the base up. And trying to get those ranking points, we focused on trying to shoot as fast as possible and focusing early on at the tournament and a qualifier level. It's interesting seeing a, a high throughput strategy and clearly it's working well for you guys <laughs> as well, I would say. So that's cool. Now that's a really interesting concept on your robot that it is. I couldn't tell from some of the match footage if it was 3D printed, if it was acrylic. Let's get a closer look and let's take a look at how your 3D printed chassis is set up here because you've got these side panel frames in. Tell me about your choice for why you chose to go 3D printed. Yeah, so if we flip the robot over, you can sort of see the bottom. So we have two go build u channels on either side and they have the, we have the wheels sitting inside of them so we milled out a gap for the wheels to go into. So we use aluminum as a structure for a dry, dry base to keep that really strong. And then onto that, we were able to bolt on with just some standoffs. We were able to bolt on plastic plates onto the outside that we can attach parts of our robot onto. <laughs> so we get the strength from aluminum, but then we can have the ease of re remaking a plate whenever we need to change things on the robot without having to go through like aluminum machine or sand cut send those parts. Mm -hmm. I really like what you've done with putting the mechanism wheel inside of a piece of U-channel and just slicing through the top. When you say you milled it out, did you mill a CNC? Did you take like a Dremel? Did you take an angle grinder to cut that top section out? Uh, we just used a manual mill. So just took measurements from the cab design and just did out manually. Now let's talk about your intake. Yeah, so beginning of season, we started out with two pairs of flexible rollers. So we had this front one and then this back one is also flexible, but we found that it would not be that reliable, especially at transferring over from the intake to the outtake. So we, our first competition, we actually had the compression off. So we decided to run some larger flap wheels, which worked a little bit, but really hurt our RP there. So going to our second competition, we decided to switch over to having all, can you, we decided to have all vectoring mechanical wheels that are vectoring it to the right side of our intake on the back to prevent it from being jammed. Since before, we were running just a bent piece of polycarb. And then we also, on the top, we decided to help transfer. We just took a little belt, a rev belt, and belted it between our intake and then our storage for our balls, just to make sure we had a constant ball contact the entirety of the way through our intake so we wouldn't have any spot where it would just start spinning or lose contact mm -hmm. with the ball. And we can give you a try to get rid of your dead zone you just have like a standard timing belt there. Yeah. Hey, that's, I mean, that's sense. That's awesome. That's wicked quick. And you can see that those vectored wheels really kick it over to the side as well. Yeah. And are those your own 3D printed vector wheel? You find that from like a printables or a maker world section? So we tried doing fully 3D printed mechanical wheels. But those didn't have enough grip for what we wanted. So we just found some small wheels that would be used for RC cars. And we 3D printed a custom hub that allowed us to mount it onto axles securely. Since those would have a lot more that's, grip. That's awesome. I love that. I love when you take things from the, from the real world in, in non-standard robotics parts and apply them into a robotics context, or context. That's always really fun to see. Cool. So that's really slick. It looks like you can hold three up inside. 
minutes. And then you have that little timing belt that's able to kick it around. And then is it this kind of like curved kind of J structure that gets it up into the flying wheel? Or how does it get up into your turreted hood? Yeah, so we have a curve going from our MJ. That's just a slight curve over to our shooter. Um, if you want to look at the inside. Um, that has some wheels around the edges of it. Just propel it in that curved circle. So we can get a lot of storage in this compact compact area where we don't have much room to store the balls. And then it just stores in a curve and then it goes over to our turret where we have a little sort of boot kicker that pushes it up into... Let me see if I can... Or I can activate it. So you have a boot kicker that just pushes them up and down. So that works pretty reliably with just manually loading one in after the other. Okay, so you got this little arm that just kind of kicks it up. And then let's talk about your turret, because it looks like it's set up on a, on a herringbone gear on the outside. Is it on Lazy Susan? Is it a bearing stack? How are you rotating this thing around? Yeah, so we took just an 8-inch Lazy Susan bearing and mounted on a 3 d printed herringbone gear that we used a on-shape uh, gear generator for, so we can get that really quickly designed up. Um, it's just being driven by a 312 RPM go build a motor that's inside of one of our structural U channels. Because we have a underneath the entire turret, we have three structural U channels alongside some of the 3D printed parts just to make sure it's still robust with the amount of 3D printing that we're using. And then that just provides the base structure for it so our ball can go through since it's such a large bearing. And then also for wiring, we are just running a short length of wire with a ID clip that's just pulling it a little bit to the side to make sure that doesn't get mm -hmm. caught in anything. And then it actually just happened that it very nicely just wraps around our bearing so that we can have good storage of that in both directions. So we didn't need to do any sort of things with like a cable chain or anything like that to constrain it even any further. That's one of those, you know, happy little surprises, right? That's awesome because yeah. cable management on a rotating turret is really, really challenging. Uh, I've seen a lot of teams rip their cables right out of that turret as that thing is spinning around. And that's a really clever way of just using, you know, some cable wrap. And then, uh, you know, one of those ID retractable badges is fun. Now, I noticed your flywheel. You said 312 RPM. I'm assuming you mean that's a bare motor that you've put a one-to-one -one gear ratio on the inside, yes? Yeah, the 312 RPM was for the current rotation, but then oh, we have okay. uh, we are running a converted 312 RPM motor that's just a one to one on the main flywheel. So you have a like a one motor flywheel, and then you have four. Looks like go build a hogwack wheels. Do you also have yeah. any uh, additional metal in there? Or what's the what's the reasoning for using four flywheels there? Yeah, so we really only need two hogback wheels in there. But we added the two on the side since we had already ordered them and we wanted to add a little bit higher moment of inertia to the flywheel so we could get more consistent throughput and uh, not have to spend so much time revving it up once we shoot a ball. It looks like you got a servo on the top of your turret as well. Is that for changing the angle of the hood? Yeah, so we took inspiration from FRC 118's 2017 robot for, what was this? What was uh, the scene of it not? Uh, Steamworks. Steamworks. So how they had it is they had similar linkage so it's sort of like an airplane flat where it can just go up and down to change our output angle and uh, one of the things that we decided to put in there was an over center linkage so that when it's in the lockdown state the linkage goes over center so this can't be back drivable so it doesn't put any extra load on our servo but then we're also able to drive it from a servo and that just helps us adjust the angle oh. so if we're really close is so the idea really close, that you just use two fixed angles then? So that was our original idea. So sort of like a gear shifter, you'd have an uh, angle for up close, angle for far away. But what we're actually able to figure out is that we can sort of put it in between and it won't keep a perfect like tangential path of the ball, but it'll still give it a little bit of a push downwards. So it'll still allow us to have a little bit more variability rather than just two set angles. And do you find that's rigid enough? Or is it one of those things where it might not be super rigid, but despite it not being super rigid, it seems to be good enough for you to be able to get that in between? Yeah, so it does have a little bit of backlash in here, but it's pretty consistent backlash. So between shots, it 
doesn't change variably. So we're just able to like count for that in the programming and just make sure we have reliable shots. I got you. So you just add a little bit of time for that backlash to kick itself back in. So you don't have it on the back end. Yeah, cool. I like that. And then it looks like you got a, a camera system on there as well. Is that a standard webcam? Is that a limelight? What is, what's going on inside there for your wow. camera vision? So we, this is an Arducam. So we were originally planning for, for the competition uh, last week to go in and do localization so we could do a common filter with our odometry position. And hopefully that should give us better accuracy. So our shooter currently does not have a camera mounted, as you can see. It was supposed to kind of be there, but we decided against it. And the reason is because we realized that it was actually just using odometry and using some trigonometry to figure out the angle our point needs to be at was a lot more consistent than we expected it to be originally. So we decided that instead of having to mount the camera on the shooter, which would actually have impact our robot-like dimensions and might might cause issues in that sense, we could instead just use odometry. And every now and then, in a couple of rounds, it does get off, uh, especially if there's a lot of robot contact. So for that, that's why we decided to attach the camera. And we our plan still is to do common filter between the camera and the robot odometry so we can hopefully get good enough accuracy to keep the tracking working for the entire robot match but however it, like for last last week it was not implemented so and then on the driver automation side what kind of things do your programmers do to make your drivers life easier during teleop so of course we have we have the the turret tracking all the time so that is definitely one thing that impacts. So our, our driver doesn't need to worry about the turn at all. The other thing is that we have the shooter RPM and the hood angle using a lookup table. So that really does help us a lot with the, with where we're shooting. So we can basically shoot from anywhere. We set up a bunch of different positions and we're using Chromite's line interpolation between points to figure out what velocity we need to be setting the RPM at and what hood angle we need to be at. So that really does ease out the driver's like workload because now the driver can basically go anywhere, hold a button down, and it'll automatically figure out if the shooter's at the correct velocity, and it'll automatically shoot once it's ready, pretty much. So that mm-hmm. is one thing. And the other thing is that we're using sensors. We're using uh, currently color, color sensors that really, that like basically help the driver figure out how many balls are in the robot. One of the problems we had like a few weeks ago during one of our other competitions is that we we constantly be getting multiple ball like penalties because we didn't know how many balls were in our robot. So for last competition, we actually have an LED setup. Uh, we have like an LED strip that's adjustable. So we use this to help the driver identify how many balls are in the robot. So there's three, the driver can quickly exit and go shoot instead of accidentally getting four. So that is definitely one thing that eases up the workload on the driver. Now you doesn't have to count how many balls. Are. So you like light up like six LEDs at a time then? Is that the idea? Yeah, it's, it's 21 LEDs. So we light up about seven at a time and seven equals one ball. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then once you have three in there, do you do a different light color for when the flywheel is at speed so that they know when they're able to shoot or is it just automatically going to pop off? There's like a vibration on the controller or something like that. Yeah, so there's a button that the the driver can hold, and when they hold the button, it's going to vibrate until it's ready to shoot, and then it'll automatically flip up the the basically the kicker and shoot the ball. Mm, okay, cool. So there is some sort of feedback to let them know that it is in a charging state, but it yes. just hasn't reached that state yet. Yes. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And then what are your plans for basing? How do you plan on getting around two robots inside of that 18-inch? But we were looking at some of the robots in how some teams are able to lift themselves above the other robot, but we thought that's probably not something we want to focus on. So instead, we're planning on running some sort of every bot style kickstand style thing. So right now we have uh, do you want... right now we have all our electronics mounted on a uh, upside down our drag brace, but we're thinking about moving these just to the side, and then we can put a kickstand in here with like an axon down there, just give us that little bit of Smaller base, mm-hmm. we'll go into the park and get two robots in there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And also going with that, we have a lot of other sister teams who are currently in our league. So if we can figure out a way to 
sort of convince some of them to go a similar route. And then whenever we're in alliance with them, we'll know there's some teams out there who can partner up with us and get that double base on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm surprised that no team has come up with like an open source kickstand design and just tried to get the community on board with trying to get that kickstand up and shared around as much as they can. Maybe that'll come up later in the season. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, I'm last question for you. I'm really curious on this 3D printed device. How frequently are you find that you're changing parts because things have snapped? What kind of material are you using? What are your what are your ideal print settings that you found that seem to work really well for your large flat plates? Yeah, so actually, it's, we're, we've been pretty surprised with the amount of strength that we're getting on the 3D printed parts. Even a few of these are really low infill and walls. Like I think some of the stuff on our shooter are still our prototype settings, which is like two walls and 10% infill. We should probably replace that. But for the stuff, that do break it's often these outer side planks just from robot to robot interactions like we have a few nicks in there right now but those we originally running three walls 15 percent infill but we decided to bump it up from and reprint we printed reprint them with a bunch of pet g which is higher impact resistance and we bumped it up to like five top bottom layers just to make it a whole lot stronger so that we don't have any parts snapping or getting dents in them that could possibly expose our wires or anything to other robots. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your robot out. I think there's some really fascinating energy on this. It's always cool to see like fully, well, mostly 3D printed robots because it's not very common in the field. And I wish you guys the best luck in the rest of the deco season. Thank you. Thank you.